Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Bom dia a todos from a very wet and rainy England as Curitiba. My name is Adam Patterson. I'm the Deputy Director of Britcham Paraná. It's great to be here with you all in one more brilliant Britcham webinar. And what a treat we have for you all today. The theme of AI in education is a hugely innovative and important topic, and it's great that we could reschedule this event. Thanks for everyone tuning in and uh, being with us today and your patience with the technical problems during the last webinar. First things first, a bit about Bridgem. Um, Bridgem's mission is to support bilateral business between Brazil and the United Kingdom by creating diverse, inclusive, prosperous, uh, and sustainable business and social environments that serve our members and help drive growth in trade, industry, services, and investment. We have offices in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Paraná, and Minas Gerais. The membership of the Chamber drives forward networking with high uh, decision-making executives in Brazil and UK. It's the biggest business uh, group for the bilateral UK-Brazil commercial trade and investment community. We have committees and discussion, discussion groups, um, including several verticals and opportunities, including sectors such as technology, agribusiness, human capital, international trade, economy, energy, mining, health, infrastructure, amongst many others. To learn a bit more about each, please do uh, visit the Chamber's website on www.bridgeham.com. BR. Um, as the director of Bridgeham Paraná, I'm also very happy that under our umbrella we have the Agro and Tech Committees, two areas where Paraná is helping to lead the national conversation. Um, let me take this opportunity as well to thank Bridgeham supporting members whose brands were widely publicized, publicized in the opening slide of this webinar and who have a fundamental role in the success of the Chamber. Uh, I also thank the University uh, of the West of Scotland and the Education Group London for being our partners in this webinar. To the speaker, Emma Carral, a fully UK qualified teacher and Teflon Q with expertise in post-compulsory teaching for accepting our invitation to bring this very relevant content to our audience. Uh, and now just a bit around the housekeeping and dynamics of today's webinar. Today's webinar is being streamed live through Zoom and YouTube. We will have speakers' presentation uh, followed by a Q&A session. For the Q&A session, uh, questions can only be sent through the Q&A tool of the Zoom platform. Um, when you are asking questions, please do mention your name and company before sending uh, so we can help identify um, and introduce uh, the questions. Um, there will be a slight curation for the questions asked, and since there is a time constraint here, we apologize for any questions that may not be addressed, answered by the speaker, but of course, we can pick up offline going forward as well. And now, uh, let me introduce today's speaker for today's exciting webinar. After all, artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize teaching and learning as we know it, and has the potential as well to address some of the biggest challenges in education today. As always, education was always our passport to the future. And when you add in distributive, uh, disruptive technology such as AI to the mix, and we have Edutech, which is the passport to the future of innovation and learning. So without much further ado, it's an honor to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Emma has worked in education for over 20 years with expertise in international education, university counseling, operations, safeguarding, curriculum development, staff management, and pastoral care. She holds degrees from the University of Exeter, the Institute of Education, Canterbury Christchurch University and Plymouth University. Um, she is both a fully UK qualified teacher and Teflon Q with expertise in post-compulsory teaching, focusing on cognitive development skills at 16 plus, career and employability skills as well. She can teach a range of subjects across the humanities, including academic English, general English, French, Russian business studies and psychology. Emma, Great to have you here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you very much to everyone who's tuning in and joining us today. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, if I could do that, that would be great. Um, if I could ask somebody to enable screen sharing, please. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. There we go. And I can get started. So, uh, there we go, that's just coming up now. Right, so um, AI 
day in EduCare, a very exciting topic, and it's an exciting time to sort of be alive as AI is beginning to develop in society, in domestic settings, in more uh, public settings, in more industrial settings. But obviously, today's focus is going to be look at how looking at how um, AI is developing in education. So to take a step back from that, I think it's important to look at how we view AI in society. So on the one hand, we have lots of ideas from science fiction that are very positive. So those sorts of dreams of AI focus on our hopes and our dreams, don't they? They sort of see AI as developing into androids who become our helpmates and our close colleagues, where we will work together to solve common problems, to move society forward. Or we look at how AI might develop to become more um, intelligent forms of entertainment for us. So software which learns our habits and preferences and then can create three-dimensional holographic images for us, like the Star Trek holodeck, that allows us to sort of live these worlds and, and, and cope with that, you know, potential of space travel, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, we also have the negative idea of how we potentially view AI in society. So we've got examples from society of the Matrix, or from the science fiction rather, of the Matrix, of the Borg from Star Trek or from Term of Terminator. And so this is where AI perhaps works against us. It learns our weaknesses and it learns how to exploit those weaknesses. It takes over and actually tries to control us and to master us a little bit more. So I think you know, we've got those two sort of extreme views in society of AI. Um, and I think today what we're going to focus on is two particular areas. We're going to look at chat GPT specifically, and we're going to look at extended reality. And we're going to look at how those two things are used in education or can be used in education. So what is chat GPT? ChatGPT is an AI-powered language model developed by an American company called OpenAI. Um, it was launched in November 2022, so it's very, very new. It's only been going about a year, and already they're on, uh, you know, quite an advanced version of the software. And it's known as Generalized Conversation AI, powered by GPT, which is Generative Pre-Trained Transformer Technology. Now, what that means is basically an AI chatbot, which we have on many websites today, it's, it's a chatbot that uses natural language processing to create very human-like um, conversational dialogue based on input prompts, which sounds very exciting, but what can it do in terms of education? So chat GPT can generate entire essays based on a prompt. So if you ask it to write a 300-word essay on... Um, you know, is social media good or bad for teenagers, it will write it. It can generate new ideas for writing tasks. It can perhaps uh, help with collaborative writing. So you've got AI generated text plus further edits. It allows you to write and respond to emails, generate research questions or schemes of work for a course. It allows for paraphrasing and it also helps with a grammar check and it does language translation. But all of those things are required. All of those things require rather a prompt. So without a prompt, uh, it's very difficult for the actual chat bot to know what to write. You have to tell it what you want it to do. So there's an important amount of human interaction there. So why is this controversial? Because this all sounds incredibly helpful and useful. I think there is three three main areas of, of controversy at the moment. So first of, all, first of all, we've got academic integrity. Second of all, we have reliability. And third, we have bias, academic bias. So when we think about academic integrity, we're thinking about um, it's uh, the use or misuse of chat GPT in written based assessments. And it's important to remember that in a lot of universities in in sort of the, the Western world or Western sort of true, um, ed educational culture, the, the most, um, the majority of assessments are written assessments. So they are essays, they are coursework, they are maybe presentations, but the presentations contain a large amount of information and writing. And that all has to be done by somebody. So one of the issues that academics worry about with ChatGPT is, well, if you put a prompt in, you could write your whole essay, you could write a whole dissertation, 
uh, using chat GPT. And it's very difficult for the lecturer to know who wrote the essay. It's not like traditional plagiarism. So with traditional plagiarism, often as a, as a lecturer, it's very easy to see, uh, does this look like it's been copied from a book or from a website? You can normally check it by putting it into Google or using um, various different other pieces of software. But with ChatGPT, it's very, very difficult to uh, know who has actually written the work. Also, unlike contract essays, essays using ChatGPT are generated for free. Students don't have to pay for them. They don't have to pay somebody somewhere to write their essay. Therefore, it's much more accessible for students. And again, it, it reduces the academic integrity because it's very difficult to know who actually wrote the piece of work. Reliability is the next problem. And this is linked to academic integrity because one of the problems with ChatGPT is it's basically a chatbot extracting information from a very large database, but it doesn't have a human checking it. So it can actually produce factually incorrect information. And alongside that, it can produce low quality responses that, that don't really answer the question or completely inappropriate responses that don't answer the question. It can overgeneralize an answer so it might not break down the constituent parts of, of an essay in the appropriate way. And because the chatbot is not the student who has sat in a number of lectures and so understands the cultural context or perhaps a nuance, <clears throat> an area of nuance in the question, there is a complete lack of contextual awareness in the essay that is generated by ChatGPT. Um, again, because it's AI, it can struggle with ethical or moral reasoning. Um, it doesn't have the cultural perspective that a student will have, a human being will have, you know, depending on where you come from in the world, your cultural perspective on uh, morals and ethics may be different, you know, it, things differ in different parts of the world. And so as a result of that, ChatGPT cannot reproduce that. It's not inside your head. It doesn't know where you are from um, in the world. So that's quite difficult to, to sort of clarify that. Studies have also begun to show that chat GPT is susceptible and can amplify bias slightly. So this bias could be cognitive bias, gender or racial bias, ideological bias, linguistic and cultural bias, sensationalism, clickbait bias, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of that, it could be in a situation where it could generate harmful content or hate speech. Remember, the key thing with this is chat GPT will produce whatever you put in as the prompt. So if the prompt is vague, it will effectively produce what it thinks is the, the correct answer, but that answer might not be correct. So that's the sort of controversy there with chat GPT. Extended reality, uh, or XR for short, is uh, a, a piece of technology which encompasses virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So it uses technology to create a more immersive digital experience. And the image here shows people using VR, or ultimately XR goggles, to view a medical uh, situation to help with the diagnosis. So it uses a combination of pose tracking and 3D near eye displays to give the user a very immersive feel of a digital or virtual world. And it offers the advantage of providing students and teachers with a standardized, reproducible environment for repeated and optimized training. So already just in that sentence, we can start to see where some of the uh, positives may come, where some of the examples of how we could use it may come. But what does it do? So the great thing about extended reality is it brings concepts to life. Um, it, for example, enables medical students, clinicians and engineers uh, to learn about different situations, uh, enables medical students and clinicians to look at the human body using mixed reality. So rather than just looking at a picture of an X-ray or a picture of a CT scan, the use of VR allows for a complete 3D image to be created. It uses real life footage to help students understand what it was like to maybe live through a significant historical period or a historical event to really understand 
understand by being in in the in the time if you like as to what it was like what happened what it felt like it would enable somebody to practice speeches and scenarios in a wide range of languages so imagine you pop on your um, xr goggles and instantly you're in front of a huge theater full of people or you're in front of a lecture hall uh, with with over you know a few hundred people that it would allow you to practice that scenario from the comfort of your office or your home it allows people to experience fine art pieces without having to go to a museum or to maybe experience geographical locations uh, for example mountains or vo volcanoes so i think extended reality has a huge a huge amount of potential uses so again what is the contro controversy here so as always um every uh, new technology has some uh, potential issues the first one with XR is cost. The second one is reliability. And the third one is really the social aspect of learning. Those are quite, those are the three sort of key areas that, that social scientists are discussing at the moment. So first of all, XR as a, as a piece of technology, it's not cheap. Uh, your school, your university or your country have to be quite rich to afford this. Um, and we know across the world, there is a disparity between countries that have a lot of money and countries that don't. Even within one country, you might have might find regions where there is a lot of money and regions where there are not. So I think as a as a way forward, there's got to be a, a sort of a very much a, an assessment of what is the cost of this? What is the uh, countries and regions have to carry out some kind of cost benefit analysis? Without that, it could lead to the widening, the widening of the skills gap between rich and poor countries. And obviously that's something that we're always trying to close, close that gap so that there is parity across the planet. Um, but the use of this technology might actually further widen that gap. The other thing relating to costs is that it could be in the future that only certain subjects are deemed worthy of the technological investment so in the examples I gave on the previous slide, we can see very easily how maybe medicine, medical students would benefit from this technology or engineering students would benefit from this technology. However, at the same time, there's nothing to say that maybe um, students who are studying Roman history would not benefit from it. So I think that could be something that could that we could see in the future where we start to see a, a sort of dichotomy spreading out between who, who is deemed worthy of having the, the technology and who is not. From an educational perspective, we've got to look at the reliability of the technology. Can it really provide the same level of teaching or assessment as an experienced tutor or an experienced practitioner? Um, you know, can, does it overgeneralize? Does it lack contextual awareness or nuance? Because while it will give you the facts and it will help um, it will help you to see what's going on. It doesn't also give you the extra information that comes with being on a hospital ward, for example, in the case of medical students, or being actually part of an engineering firm and seeing the different elements of the company. It will give you sort of access, if you like, to a very, perhaps a very na narrow area of um, practice. And then we've got the social aspect of learning. Um, you know, if you picture a classroom or a lecture theatre where everyone is plugged into VR headsets, it's quite an insular um, experience of learning. And is that really the best thing for human beings? You know, we as a species are social beings. We like to talk to each other. We like to get to know each other. And while the pandemic has really enhanced digital education and has enabled us to really, you know, learn at distance, a lot of people really still crave that face-to-face, -face, uh, very physical experience of learning. You know, students learn from each other. You learn from your classmates, you know, both the strong classmates and the weaker classmates. Students form identity groups, social identity groups at university or at school. These help them to define themselves. You know, if we move away from that style of learning, well, what does that mean for that for those social interactions and the ability to to make friends, develop contacts, to network. Because ultimately when you go into the workplace, that's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to have that skill of being able to 
work with or without this technology, probably likely without the technology. So it's it's sort of a while it might be really useful to have it at school or university, how much are you going to really use it in the real world? So I think those are some of the areas that people consider as uh, potential controversies with that technology. But what are the opportunities generally for teaching, learning and for critical thinking? Well, I think we've got three again. Um, we've got content versus process, so content learning versus process learning, promoting critical thinking, and we've got research tools. Those, I think, are the three main opportunities for teaching and learning. So content versus process is the first thing. <clears throat> so the use of AI, or so the use of ChatGPT and VR, um, XR specifically, I think has the potential to transform learning. Because as we know, there are sort of two types of things that we learn. So we learn the content, the actual meat of the subject, but we're also learning how to learn. We're learning how to study, how to uh, remember, how to record, how to evaluate, how to synthesize. So the use of AI and technology could actually transform how people learn because it will allow students to potentially focus on the content rather than the process. So imagine you have to write a dissertation, but you've never written a dissertation before. That's quite a scary thought for a lot of students. But if you had a way that somebody or something could take care of the process of writing the dissertation, but all you had to do was provide the content, that could potentially allow you to access that um, access that learning or access that qualification. Students can also use ChatGPT to assist with language and structure so that they can better express their ideas, again, relating to content, which could be particularly useful for students of a foreign language. So, for example, if I wanted to write a paper in Chinese, I could use ChatGPT to help me do that. Now, that's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a very positive thing because it would allow my work to suddenly be open up, opened up to all of China. Equally, if a Chinese professor wanted to write something in English and they didn't speak English, they could use ChatGPT to get a fairly decent translation of what they wanted. And then again, that would open up their work to the English speaking world. So I think it's got you know some real opportunities for learning. It could also be used to promote critical thinking. So for example, with ChatGPT, you could have a ChatGPT generated essay or some kind of extended reality scenario. And maybe what students have to do is they have to fact check it. They have to look at it and consider how much bias is in there. They have to expand on points of reality, expand on points made in the, in the actual essay. So what that does is it turns the student almost into uh, the teacher or assessor, because it allows the student to um, look at a piece of work, look at it critically and actually mark it. So not be sort of so head in the actual the actual assignment itself, but it's almost like taking somebody else's assignment and marking it and looking at it and going, well, how much does this meet the marking criteria? And often it's those kinds of exercises in uh, education where students really progress and develop because it's not just about, you know, can I pass the exam? It's, it's how well can I pass the exam? It's do I understand the marking criteria? Do I understand the question? Do I understand the assessment criteria? Do I understand what's being asked of me? So that's that's very important. The other thing that's uh, pro promoting critical thinking is that it could allow students to edit or to add to AI generated content. So you're developing that ability to work collaboratively with AI because AI is not going anywhere in 20 years 30 years 40 years time you know our grandchildren will be looking at this you know a PowerPoint like that are like this and just sort of laugh at how how what we were thinking about you know sort of 40 years ago um but it will allow people to develop those skills to work better with AI to understand it more and I think that's a really important part of AI in education um, and AI in society as a whole is it's about understanding it, learning what it can and what it can't do and how to get the most out of it. Um, 
from the perspective as a research tool, obviously you can see that uh, chat GPT or extended reality could be really interesting um, and really helpful, perhaps in place of Google. But I think the key thing with using AI as a research tool of any sort is prompt engineering. So really learning about how to give accurate prompts. Because as I said before, you could write a, a 300 word essay on is social media good or bad for teenagers? Um, and you would get an answer, but the answer might not fully answer the question because the question isn't detailed enough. The prompt doesn't have enough nuances written in for the AI to work with. So I think we're going to see over time as AI comes into education more, we're going to see the need for better prompt engineering. And, and we all know this is the case, because if you type something into Google, you know, you think about all the different tips and tricks that we know that help us to get better search responses from Google. So we know that prompt engineering is, is something really important. <clears throat> I think that you need to take that or one needs to take that to the next level when it comes to uh, prompt engineering with chat GPT or AI programs. So, I mean, as a research tool, using uh, either XR or AI, uh, chat GPT rather, to explore a new topic, clarifying existing knowledge, you know, what's it like inside a volcano? If you can slip on your goggles and have a look in, you can get a much better sense of the just the geological processes that are going on. Um, understanding and exploring a new topic that you don't know anything about, using ChatGPT to generate research questions, to generate further ideas that will help you to explore different avenues of research. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, it could be that, you know, ChatGPT will come up with an area of um, your topic that you're researching that maybe you haven't considered before. Um, and that's obviously very helpful to you as a research researcher. And it could also therefore recommend further resources and reading. You know, we, we all have access to libraries and e-libraries and lots of databases of material, but it's probably quicker for ChatGPT to run through those and go, have you thought about X, Y, Z reference, which you might not have done because it would take you maybe a hundred times as long to go through the same e-library and think about the search words, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are lots of opportunities uh, in education for both chat GPT and VR, XR rather. Um, I think it's just how we how we use it. And as always, it's about the humans learning how to use the technology properly. So what might be the biggest changes as a result of these? And this is sort of extrapolations for you know, 20, 30, 40 years time. I think we're gonna have to look at teacher training um, because that's a big that's a big area. We're also going to have a look at course structure and course content. And we're going to have to, perhaps one of the biggest ones of all is rethink student assessment, rethink student assessment. So teacher training, you've got a balance of an initial teacher, so initial teacher training and an experienced tutor. So one of the big things we're gonna to have to look at is what do the teachers of the future need to know in order to successfully integrate these new technologies into their teaching? So what do teachers of the future need to know, but also what do current teachers need to know? If you think back sort of 20, 30 years ago, uh, when computers were coming into schools and were becoming part of the general sort of workplace and education uh, environment, they were new, brand new things. They were things that teachers knew nothing about. So teachers who had tra trained 10 or 20 years previously have never used computers. And there they were trying to teach my, my generation at school how to use computers. And so I think we can see, you know, and again, certainly one of the things when I worked in a school, we used uh, interactive whiteboards, so smart boards, and we all had to have very specific training sessions on how to use those. So I think if we're looking at, you know, 20, 30 years time and this technology really being part of the educational environment, Teachers and lecturers at all levels of education are going to need quite a lot of training on how to use this, how to use it correctly, how to use it effectively, and therefore how to train their students on how to use it effectively and correctly. Because without that teacher training, it will always be something that is, is pushed to the side 
or it will be something that teachers are slightly nervous about using purely because they don't have the time to fit it into their curricula, which takes me on to point number two, course structure and course content. What might need to change in the curricula of the future in order to accommodate this new technology? And it's not about um, removing content, so removing things, topics that students might learn. It's more about thinking, how can we integrate this new technology into our schemes of work, into our courses, into our uh, possibly assessments? How can we do that so that the students are not only presenting content, but they're presenting it using appropriate technology? So for example, um, one of the assessments that, that students might have to complete is a PowerPoint presentation. So you prepare a PowerPoint, the student you know, stands up at the front of the class, the student's got their PowerPoint and their notes, and they're talking about whatever the topic is they're talking about. So within that, naturally, you'll be marking them on the quality of the presentation, how they speak, how they, what their delivery is like, the quality of their PowerPoint, what do the slides look like, are they clear, um, is it well presented, is it organised? But also, you're uh, marking them on the actual content. Have they answered the question that you asked them for the presentation? So that there is an example of not only are you marking the student on um, have they answered the question, the content, but you're marking them on, on their ability to use the technology required around uh, the assessment, the assignment, because that's what they're going to need for the workplace. And that's something that might have to happen. We might have to start looking at what's in the core, what are in the courses so that students can access this technology, they can use it and they can become proficient with it. Um, making sure that it's not just something that's like an extra toy to play with, but actually it becomes an integrated part of the, the university course or the school course for those students. And it could be that some topics as a result of the integration of this technology can be studied in more depth, uh, can be studied in more detail. Um, and maybe, you know, which is obviously a positive thing for, for, all, for all students. And it, and it could be that maybe some, some subjects rather are naturally more suitable to using this type of technology than others. Um, we, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens over the next 20 or 30 years. I think as well, the use of AI in education will result eventually in some kind of rethinking of student assessment. And again, going back to the point of when we started using computers, you know, before all assessments were handwritten uh, essays, whereas now everything is typed. You never really have to handwrite uh, an essay at university or at school, things that you would, school possibly yes, but certainly in higher education, everything is typed up and it's there's an expectation that you will understand how to use that. You will have used a computer, you will be proficient in Word, proficient in Excel and probably proficient in PowerPoint as well. So I think integrating this new technology will mean that we will have to um, rethink how we assess students, what we are expecting them to do. So it could be we have staged assessments where we look at um, showing evidence of research before writing and various different drafts. And that might be a way to get around the academic integrity problem. So in order to see that it is the student who has written the work, we might have a set of, um, a set of assessments which are drafts version one, two, three, and then the final essay before submission. So that allows the lecturer to see that it's definitely the student who has written the essay. Uh, we could look at presentations with assessed questions. So with the use of chat GPT, the student could you know, give a presentation. We, we may or may not know that they have used chat GPT to support them, but we will, as lecturers, we will be able to assess the student's knowledge by having assessed questions at the end of the presentation, by seeing, okay, does the student actually know the answer to the questions or did they get everything from um, ChatGPT? Now, it could be that we look at group assessments 
um, whether we're using VR or uh, chat GPT. So we look at using group assessments where everybody is marked on a particular area or a particular um, topic, subtopic of the, the main topic or question. But at the same time, everybody is being marked on how have they worked together as a group to maintain that social element of learning. So that it's not just about, did you go to chat GPT? Did you get your essay and did you hand it in? It's no, no. How have you worked together as a group? How have you consciously developed those social interaction skills? Um, because as we all know, that's incredibly important for the workplace. We could also move to, <clears throat> excuse me, personal reflection assignments. Again, so where the student is looking at how their learning has developed, which only they can answer, um, or they can reflect on the experience of using a VR scenario uh, for uh, a particular topic of learning or for a particular assignment. How did it feel to do that? What did you feel was missing? How did you feel the experience helped you to grow as a, cl a clinical practitioner? So that's, that's an option as well. And then I think we have to look at, do we go back to traditional exams where people are sat in an exam hall um, writing, physically writing, so they have to have the knowledge to be able to do that? Or do we look at some more practical assessments in some way where maybe um, it's practical techniques, it's practical on the spot, here's a task, and your assessment is you have one hour to do X, Y, Z. That's another option as well. So I think there are lots of things we can do in the future, but it will require thinking. I don't think it will be a, a quick, there's not a quick solution to how do you use AI effectively in education? I think there are lots of ways to use AI. Um, and I think it's going to require a lot of thinking um, in order to make sure that it's used correctly. And just some final thoughts, really, sort of linked to what I've said is, you know, on, on the, the screen there, I've got some examples of sort of technology that has uh, appeared in the last sort of 150 or so years. But all of these examples of technology have been superseded by other things. So we are aware that technology comes and technology, once it comes, it's not going away. It's not going anywhere. It's going to stay. Um, you know, but it might get superseded by something else. And we've seen that in the last 100, 150, couple of hundred years. As technology has developed, it's come in, it's done wonders for the time, and then it's developed further. And AI is almost the next step in that development, isn't it? Um, I think it's not going away. It's not going anywhere. Um, but I think we shouldn't be afraid of it. I think it's about learning how to work with it and learning how to manage it carefully so that we are not so that we so that we remain in control really but particularly with education it's about enhancing the educational experience it's not about being afraid of it it's not about you know any problems it's really about enhancing the educational experience so that the students and that's the ultimate thing it's so that the students benefit to become better in the workplace in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, a really brilliant uh, and interesting talk. Uh, and without doubt, certainly lots of food for thought there. It's really interesting topic. Um, now, before opening up to our audience uh, for questions, uh, and please do uh, send questions on the chat, remembering uh, to identify yourselves. Uh, let me just take the opportunity to kick off uh, with some questions to get uh, the discussion in motion. Um, mm -hmm. Firstly, so what does good look like for the future performance of AI in education? Uh, and moreover, how can we effectively measure its impact? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, good, gosh, good can be so many different things, can't it? I think that, you know, if you if you take how we use technology today, the ideal is um, a, a an, em, an employee or employer in the future who can walk into any room, who can, you know, start their computer, who can use any package or profile proficiently, who isn't afraid to jump in and play with Excel, play with a database, look at this, look at this, look at that, the other. And 
and have that range of very proficient IT skills. I think good for the future would be the use of AI within that kind of per persona in the future. So in order to have that, you would need to have a certain amount of training and confidence and ability that starts in school um, and develops right the way through university and goes into the workplace. And obviously this is you know several years, several decades possibly into the future. But I think at some point, the use of AI will have to come into into schools in the way we see, you know, primary school use ch children using iPads, learning those digital skills, because today's children are digital natives. They are very much plugged into the Internet, into the online world. And so I think we will see AI just become part of that. Um, measuring its impact, I think, gosh, only time will tell what amazing things could we create or could we achieve if humans and AI work together? Um, I think, you know, there was a, a, a story in the news a couple of years ago, but that some AI had been sent through over uh, however many thousands of papers relating to cancer. And through that search, it had fed all the data, it processed all the data, and there was some great technological move forward of have we thought about this kind of treatment? You know, the idea is to work together to look at all the data and the information that's there, use AI to sift through that to actually make a real impact for humanity in the future. I mean, that, I suppose, is the ultimate of measuring the impact of that. Yeah, well, excellent stuff. I remember, I think, I think you're right, it's like a, like a, a natural evolution, right? Uh, you mentioned like iPads and even like mm. the use of the internet. And I remember when I was a primary school, we just had one computer in the corner. It was in like a big blue, uh, big blue metal case, almost like a safe, right? And then yeah. I've advanced totally from that over the last 30 or so years. Um, um, so just picking up on that. So um, we've seen the positive, we've seen where potentially it's going. Uh, can you just dig a, a bit deeper perhaps in some of the, the, the risks and challenges. Um, so, I mean, you, you mentioned training, uh, but also if you could just pick up a few uh, points on the regulation and assessment challenge as well that we could potentially see well, over the, the next few years. I mean, that's it. That's that you've hit the nail on the head there. Regulation of AI is, you know, absolutely huge. I think, you know, in the way we look at how uh, the internet is or is not regulated, we look at how social media, for example, the regulation of social media in certain packages like that, it's not where it really needs to be to keep everybody safe. You know, yes, there are age appropriate safeguards, but there's always a very quick fix work around these sorts of safeguards, it, it seems, when you read the media and when you sort of think about experiences that you've had. So I think regulation of AI is going to be huge, um, is huge and is going to be huge. I think that if it's not regulated, um, you know, I mean, the worst case scenario is somebody joins AI up to the internet properly. And then we're in a Skynet Terminator horrific scenario where actually AI suddenly decides, do you know what? This this is not helping the planet. Um, this, these, these, this species is not good for the planet and it all goes hideously wrong. And okay, that's a bit of a science fiction scenario. However, it is possible, you know, we all know that there are lots of issues on the planet relating to the environment that have been caused by humans. We can't deny that. Um, and so as a result, you know, if you were a computer looking at that very objectively with just looking at the facts and going, well, what's the problem? How do I eliminate the problem? If AI starts to see the problem as us, then, then you know, how do we cope with that? So, I mean, that's obviously a really negative extreme, but I think regulation of AI, how it's used, its access, what it has access to, and how it evolves and grows and develops will be very, very important in the next 50 to 100 years. Excellent. So I hope we can avoid some type of Skynet scenario, right? I mean, it's <laughs> funny, right? The, the Terminator films yeah. start with science fiction and we're close to getting to, to science fact, mm -hmm. um, but obviously hugely important to flag up uh, the risks as well as the benefits. Um, got a, a question here um, from one of my colleagues uh, in the chamber on, on the chat here. Um, the question is, are there any other technologies already that are capable of checking the information generated by chat GBT uh, to make sure uh, it's not an article or it's based on an article from another person? Is, is there any new tools being developed um, as such 
um, that can improve on existing technology to make sure it really is independent thought, obviously based upon on previous literature and what have you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the biggest thing that we use, certainly in UK higher education, is a program called Turnitin, uh, which I think is probably used in a lot of different countries. And that allows for what Turnitin does is it scans the, the essay and it cross references it to pretty much everything that's ever been published. So as soon as a document is published, at some point, a version of it goes into the Turnitin database. And as a response to ChatGPT, Turnitin are currently working on a new layer of software um, that tries to look at, does this look like it's AI generated or does this look like it has actually been created by a person? Um, I think that's due to come in probably next year. Uh, it's being created at the moment. So I think when that comes in, that will go some way to um, hopefully mitigating the idea of just getting chat GPT to write your essay. But obviously, as is the case with all these things, it will continually need to evolve over the next five to 10 years because chat GPT will also evolve over the next five to 10 years. A bit of a cat and mouse game, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, excellent stuff. Just for a, a last question here. So you talked about um, the, the next few years and what, what we can expect. So, I mean, just before this webinar, I was researching um, the advent of artificial um, intelligence. Um, and I was picking up on some articles from the early 90s uh, that were mm -hmm. saying that over the next few years, so by mid 90s, right, um, AI was, was promising to transform education. So it's been a while now. Um, just to close out with some thoughts, I mean, so how close are we actually getting? What's different now? Uh, and what's some of the, the next innovations we can expect over the next few years that we're not even not even thinking about yet? I think, I mean, sort of, sort of to, to, to take a step back from, from that question before I answer it fully, I think the thing to remember is that, you know, it, it is uh, quite expensive technology and uh, it it's it's how much money does your school or your national government or regional government want to spend on uh on that kind of technology um i think that at the moment there are lots of different types of uh programs available there are lots of different apps there are lots of different computer programs where there is an element of ai in the the software which learns your mis learns from your mistakes and gives you maybe more exercises on a particular uh, topic you know for example with maths apps and science apps it'll run through you know however you answer the questions and then it will give you more practice questions of that type that you've got where you've got more answers incorrect and obviously that's great because that allows for the students to really grow and develop and really practice the things that they need to practice more of without having to do that sort of assess self-assessment so the ai does that assessment for them things like uh, uh extended reality and vr are currently being used by certainly by uh, medical students at ucl and imperial in london um they are being used to just look at um scans and pictures of the human body in a more sort of intimate detailed way to be able to help diagnose problems um and obviously for for digital natives coming through the the education system having that level of interactive technology is really powerful we've also got examples of uh you know students using this sort of technology for maybe science experiments, maybe looking at history and at geography. So these things are starting to appear in schools, but they're very often a bit more one-off gimmicky type sort of experiences. They're not a standard everyday experience. What we do have in London, which is literally just opening at the moment, is there is a new tourism exhibition over in Stratford in East London. And it's all about seeing the pyramids in the time when they were built. And I think it's about 45, 50 pounds to go and have this tour. And it's you're in a room and you put your goggles on and you basically can tour the pyramids and ancient Egypt as it was back in the time of the pyramids being built. Now, that's really interesting because that's sort of really the some of the first times that we're seeing that sort of commercial historical tourism really coming into play in society. And obviously, once that becomes the norm, then at some point in the future, we'll start to see it become the norm in other environments because you could take your history group on a school trip to that and then you can start to see how that could extrapolate 
into more widespread use in the future. Well, crazy, absolutely great. If I'd have known that about the exhibition in Stratford last week, I would have definitely gone. I'll pick it up next time I am there. Um, Emma, um, I'm mindful of the time here, uh, and although we'd love to carry on, I think we're going to have to start to close out there. Uh, but I'll just shoot back over to you for your closing thoughts, if you'd be so kind. Mm. Um, I think, you know, as I said, AI isn't going anywhere. Um, I think AI is a very, very exciting prospect for the development of humanity. But as with everything, um, you know, human history has shown us that humans generally fear the unknown. We are slightly concerned by the unknown. Um, and that the training hasn't always been there to ensure that everybody has access to the, the new type of technology. I think if we want AI to be successful in education, we have to train the teachers, the teachers of tomorrow and the teachers of today to not be afraid of it, to understand it, to fully integrate it into their lessons and their learning and their teaching rather. And we also have to look at how that technology will then appear in the workplace afterwards. Because it's once it's in the workplace, that need for people entering the workplace to know how to use it will start to trickle down. And that's when I think we'll see the greater impact of AI in education. Um, so it's, it's not going anywhere. And I think as always, as so long as we have the training and we have the, the control and we have the thinking about how we want to use it effectively, then we should be absolutely fine. Great stuff. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and on that note, uh, I would like to thank uh, you once again for being our brilliant speaker today. And of course, the University of the West of Scotland and the Education Group London for being our partners in this webinar. Really rich and pertinent discussion. Uh, I'd like to carry on, but uh, mindful of the time. Uh, huge thanks as well to the audience for being with us today. We do hope it's been a fruitful and interesting event for everyone. I've certainly learned a lot and I might have to watch Terminator again this weekend uh, to do some research. Uh, just to flag to all the Brick Champs upcoming events are available on the website, uh, brickchamp.com br. Uh, I do invite everyone to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well, share the link of the recording of this webinar. Um, that being said, I wish everyone a great rest of the day, an awesome end of the year. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you once again, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.